Hey, get off your phone. What are you doing over there? Take better notes. That's it. 1245. 1245. You all have 1245. Just trying to stay in shape. Okay, welcome back. This is chapter 16, Reconstruction. So we fought the Civil War. The country is in ruins, both sides, the North and the South. And we got to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So there's a couple of plans on how to do it. Lincoln's plan is called the 10% plan. Now, the other plan is called the Wade Davis Bill. And we will talk about which one is a better deal for the South. And that has to do with the lens of what's the South now? Are they our brothers that we were fighting with, but now we want to welcome them back into the family? Or they are they our opponents whom we vanquished? And to the victors go the spoils, and now it's time to go to the South and take everything they have left. Which lens are we going to view this from? Now, just because they lost the war doesn't mean the South is going to give up um, you know, give up their racist ways. So they're going to institute some things called black codes. And we'll talk about that. Slaves are now going to be referred to as freedmen. So when you hear about the Freedmen's Bureau, that is a, a bureaucracy set up to help people that were formerly slaves get into society and get an education, get a job, things of that nature. Lincoln will be assassinated. We'll need to know three amendments. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment are called the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, KKK stands for Ku Klux Klan. We'll talk about that. And then we'll get to the 14th Amendment there. Um, okay, so understand the problems with Reconstruction. Some people see the South as brothers. They want to make amends. Some people see the South as a vanquished opponent. And that is the lens at what we're trying to do here. Um, how does Lincoln's assassination impact Reconstruction? Lincoln's 10% plan was very favorable for the South. When he's assassinated, the South loses a friend. And what is the Civil Rights Act? It guarantees the rights of all people, except Native Americans. Here's our timeline. We'll be talking about the 10% plan, the Civil Rights Act, the Freedmen's Bureau, 14th Amendment. We've got most of this stuff on here coming up soon. Okay, before I tell you the answers, the Civil War is over, but what problems still remain? Okay, the Civil War is over. What problems do you think could still remain for the country to face? Brainstorm. What do you think? All right. Did you get any of these? Here we go. The economy. It's in ruins. Uh, Confederate money is now worthless. Real quick. Here's some different Confederate bills. They're all from around 1864. Here's one from Georgia. Cool. Okay, so the economy is in ruins. The paper money. Why would, why would the Confederate money be worthless all of a sudden? Because there is no Confederacy anymore. That country no longer exists. Your money is now worthless. Okay, you have wounded soldiers on both sides. They might not be able to work. Who's going to tend for them? Who's going to help them with medical care? You have the freedmen. These people never got an access to education and they de don't necessarily know what to do with them. And that's going to be a problem. Okay. They have no job. They have no land. Uh, what's their opportunity going to look like? And then the actual physical destruction. Most of the battles were fought in the South, which means most of the buildings were fought in the South. Real quick, use your, me uh, your memory. Who had a march to the sea? Right, William Tecumseh Sherman's march to the sea. And on his march, he did what? What's the big important event? 
What city? Burned down Atlanta. Exactly. So you have the destruction of a major city in the South. What are we going to do about that? Let's talk about the 10% plan. Okay. Lincoln said, look, if 10% of you will swear allegiance to the United States, you're back in. You're back in. Once 10% have sworn allegiance, you're back in the Union. Amnesty for all the low-level soldiers, for all the people that fought. Now, if you were in the government or if you were a general or something, an officer, then not so fast. But if you're just a soldier, you're going to be uh, forgiven and welcome back to the Union. So that is Lincoln's 10% plan. I'll give you a second to write that down. Okay, now compare and contrast that with the Wade Davis bill, which said 50% of people must swear allegiance uh, to the United States. And if you fought at all, if you were not forced, if you were not drafted, if you were not conscripted, if you fought at all for the Confederacy, well, then there's going to be voting restrictions on you. Okay, again. The, this is the lens. Are, are you my brother and we're bringing you back into the country? Or were you my opponent? Should I go down there and take from you what little you have left? Okay. Critical lens uh, to view reconstruction. Okay. What's a freedman? People that were formerly slaves. Well done. So what do we do with them? How do we help them? That's what the Freedmen Bureau is, okay? A way to help slaves transition into free life. And how are you going to help them? One of the major ways is with school. Let me read something from the book. Okay, here's the quote. The majority of my pupils came from plantations three, four, and eight miles distant, she wrote. So anxious are they to learn that they walk these distances so early in the morning. Okay, believe it or not, throughout time, your goal with your life was to maximize your life. You want to maximize your education potential. You want to be all you can be. And so real quick pep talk, I know it's distance learning. I know it's hard to stay focused sometimes. You've got your earbuds in right now. Take them out. Do the best you can. You've got to want to get that education. Nobody can make you want to win. You've got to want. That's got to come from within. Okay, so let's go. Uh, you're going to go education. How else? Find jobs. Uh, adjudicate claims because they're going to say, wait a second, that wasn't fair. Or, you know, this person wronged me. Someone needs to be their legal advocate. And so Freedmen can turn to the Freedmen's Bureau and find that advocacy. What does habeas corpus mean? Habeas corpus. Very good. Show me the body. You must be, uh, you must have a trial. Good memory. Good job. Okay. Lincoln is murdered right after the end of the Civil War. John Wilkes Booth at the Ford Theater goes up and shoots him. How can this negatively impact the South? Why will Lincoln getting shot actually have a negative impact on the South? Tell me why. Five, four, three, two, one. Very good, very good. Because Lincoln's plan was much. Uh, more friendly, we'll say, than the Wade Davis bill. Good job. Here's what a Derringer looks like. It's a small pistol. And here is a reenactment of the assassination of Lincoln.
again, I, I say, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. We shall bind up the nation's wounds and cherish peace. That government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. God bless you all. Mr. Lincoln, I'm, I'm just proud of you. Here, Peanuts. Hold the horse for me, will you? Yes, sir. Will you be long, sir? No, not very long. Would you mind bringing me a glass? I did it wrong. No, I, I'm afraid you must be mistaken. Mr. Lincoln has just stopped the draft. <laughs> <laughs> important concept after the death of Lincoln the way reconstruction was going is going to change it was going to be more there are brothers bring them back and Lincoln was going to be very benevolent he's dead so now it's going to switch over to there are opponents what can we do uh, to, to take from them just a few days after the North had won the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln decided to celebrate by going to the theater. Actor John Wilkes Booth crept around and shot him from behind. And the question remains, what if he had never gone to the theater? What if Abraham Lincoln had lived? So Andrew Johnson suddenly and without any preparation becomes the 17th president and he has none of the skills, none of the resources, none of the residue of goodwill that Abraham Lincoln did 
Rather than having this battle over reconstruction that lasted for another 11 years, I think it would have been a slower, steadier reunion. Lincoln would have been a more inspiring leader to reconcile the sections and the races. Johnson was not capable of that and had no interest in racial equality at all. Abraham Lincoln would have also fought for infrastructure. He was always in favor of roads, bridges, railroads, canals. Frankly, I think southern states would have benefited. Think about what his leadership after the war would have meant. An economy not based on slavery and not based alone on agriculture, but some construction projects that would have widened opportunity, job opportunity, in southern states that had too long been almost a nation apart. Three days before he was killed, he called for voting rights for educated African Americans and those who had served in the army. Pretty radical. John Wilkes Booth was actually in the crowd, turned to a friend and said, that's the last speech he'll ever make. He wanted to shoot him on the spot. Three days later, he did. I think we should take Abraham Lincoln at his word. He was going to commit himself to getting the vote for people of color, particularly in the South, where the voting concentration was, even if it was just for political reasons, to create a two-party system and possible Republican advantage in Southern states. It might not have been necessary to have a second revolution, a second civil war over civil rights in the 1960s. Okay, welcome back. 13th Amendment bans slavery. Please write it down, take a picture. You need to know three amendments for Reconstruction. 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The 13th Amendment bans slavery, okay? Your primary source is the Black Codes, and some of you are gonna breeze through it, try to read it to the best of your ability. I really want you to and this will probably be your uh, question for tomorrow. What are the similarities and differences between the black codes and the slave codes? Some of these laws have, um, they're the same, you know, take a look at it and you tell me, okay? I don't want to give too much away, but here we go. Black codes are laws to control African-Americans. Okay, fine. You're not a slave anymore, but you still live in the South. The South didn't just wake up, um, and everything's fixed and everything's good. The South is still deeply racist and they're gonna create laws and codes that uh, institutionalize that ra racism, okay? Okay, the Civil Rights Act, check this out. It grants citizenship to African-Americans, guarantees the rights for everyone except Native Americans. And, um, President Johnson vetoes this bill. So then Congress overturns the veto. What's it called when you have one branch of government and they're going back and forth, but not you don't want one to have too much power? What's that called? Checks and balances. Well done. What is the ultimate check and balance? An amendment to the Constitution. So they overturn the president's veto. And then just to make sure that there's no discrepancy, that there's no repercussion or, or anything from the court. They passed the 14th Amendment. That's game over. That's checkmate, okay? That's the Civil Rights Act. The, okay, and despite the fact that they passed the Civil, the Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment, there's still going to be injustice and inequality up until when they pass the, the next Civil Rights Act, what we think of the Civil Rights Act in 1960 excuse me, 1964. Let me read real quick from the 14th Amendment. It says that all people born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. The amendment also declares that states may not pass laws that take away citizens' rights, nor can a state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process or law, nor deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Life, liberty, property, who said it? Who is John Locke. Exactly. John Locke. Well done. Okay. So the country will be divided into five military districts. 
the states have to write a new constitution and they have to ratify the 14th Amendment. That means they have to vote for it, make it law, and here are your opposing plans for Reconstruction. A quick re reunion with the 13th Amendment only, or the Republicans who want real change, they want that 14th Amendment as well, as part of your um, state constitution, as part of your um, to coming back into union as part of, as part of the plan. Okay, check this out. This is interesting. Your first African American governor, and he's born to a white slaveholder and a Minuto uh, woman. So uh, he becomes the first African American governor in 1872. The second African American governor and the first one elected is not until 1989. That's going to be the lasting problem is that it's not like, oh, everything, everything's fixed. Oh, civil war's over. <laughs> All fixed. All fixed. No, there's, there's these problems that started that caused the civil war. And these problems don't go away just because some of the bureaucracy and some of the political problems are gone. Doesn't mean some of the social problems aren't gone. If you're a Southern person and you had support, and you had opposed secession. You get a you get a, a, a term. You're called a scallywag. So write that down as your vocab word. What is a scallywag? A southern white who had opposed secession. And if you're in the north and you want to take advantage of the south suffering and you want to go down there and start a business or go down there and profit in some way, you are a carpetbagger. And that comes from the idea that you just throw everything you own into a carpet, roll it up, and you know, right on down there. And then you take advantage of the fact that they need uh, some help. Since the end of the war, black political conventions had been taking place across the South. The central issue was black suffrage. We simply ask that we be recognized as men, declared the South Carolina Convention of Colored People, that the same laws which govern over white men shall govern black men. We stood by the government when it wanted help, a delegate from Mississippi wrote President Johnson. Now, will it stand by us? In New Orleans, Hundreds of black men declared they were ready to fight for the right to vote. Militant whites in the city vowed to stamp out black agitators and radical Republicans. President Johnson dismissed the growing signs of trouble. At midday on July 30th, 1866, New Orleans exploded. At the state convention, a mob attacked white radical Republican delegates and their black supporters. The Republicans were chased out of the convention hall and shot down. Black men were murdered in the streets. By the time federal troops restored order, 34 blacks and three white radicals had been killed. And the radicals say, we told you. We told you that unless you stamp out this serpent of white power in the South, unless you kill it, that it's gonna rise up again. in the South turned the midterm elections of 1866 into a referendum on presidential reconstruction. With Union war hero Ulysses S. Grant at his side, Johnson barnstormed the Northeast and the Midwest. 
dubbed the Swing Around the Circle, the speaking tour was an unprecedented effort to sell his policies to Northern voters. It was a disaster. At the podium, the president traded insults with hostile crowds and blamed the slaughter in New Orleans on Congress. He called the leadership of the Republican Party traitors. He even referred to himself as a Jesus figure being crucified on the cross of radical reconstruction, which to many Northerners was just a kind of uh, pathetic political rhetoric. Many Northerners felt that black people should receive only minimal constitutional protections. And it is the South's intransigence and the policy that President Johnson pursues by encouraging the South to reconstitute itself that drives many Northerners away from his position. The Atlantic Monthly called the president egotistic to the point of mental disease, insincere as well as stubborn, cunning as well as unreasonable, vain as well as ill-tempered. That fall, Republicans won three-fourths of the seats in both houses of Congress, enough to override any Johnson veto. In only 18 months, the radicals had gone from a fringe minority to the center of Republican leadership. Now it was their turn to define the course of Reconstruction. Thaddeus Stevens was 75 years old, so frail that he had to be carried into the House of Representatives by admirers. In a voice his colleagues could barely hear, the tireless Stevens made a final plea for federal intervention in the southern states. Congress has been sitting here, and while the South has been bleeding at every pore, Congress has done nothing to protect the loyal people there, white or black, either in their persons, in their liberty, or in their property. In March 1867, both houses of Congress again rejected a veto by President Johnson and passed the Radicals' Reconstruction Plan. The former Confederate states were divided into five military districts, each commanded by a general with power to enforce law and administer justice. New Southern governments would be created. They would have to ratify the 14th Amendment their new state constitutions would have to be approved by Congress. And black men would have the right to vote. This really was a remarkable leap in the dark for world history. It's the first large-scale experiment in interracial democracy that had existed anywhere. <laughs> When Tunis Campbell learned of the Radicals' bold plan, he immediately decided to run for office. Marshall Twitchell also went into politics. As a delegate to Louisiana's Constitutional Convention, it was like nothing he'd ever seen. More than half the delegates were black. Within a year, Andrew Johnson would be impeached by the Senate for high crimes and misdemeanors. His presidency would survive by a single vote. Soon after this, Ulysses S. Grant, okay, famous general in the Civil War, will become the president. Now here's our 15th Amendment. This extends suffrage to African Americans what does suffrage mean? Excellent. Right, the right to vote. Perfect, okay? So, um, by the way, African-American men, women still don't have the right to vote, okay? Not till the 19th Amendment. Um, states can still have voting requirements, and we'll talk about that. That is going to be a way 
to keep African Americans from voting. All right? The Ku Klux Klan is designed or originated to keep African Americans from utilizing their political power. So you have the right to vote, but we're going to scare you enough that you don't go out and vote. Okay? Um, and, and obviously they're attacking African Americans more, but they're attacking people that support African Americans as well. So the Ku Klux Klan, that's what that is there. Okay, that's today's lecture. I hope you had a great day. Make sure you do quality work on the assignment tomorrow. Uh, that is in place of class time. You should be spending at least 45 to 50 minutes on the assignment. And um, I'll see you back here soon.